Hi, everybody. Uh, we come to you with so much energy and both of us just feel super, super great. I think that'll be evident as we go through the video. Um, this is Matthew from the channel, Matthew Sharapa. And <laughs> this is so funny because we were going to make a video responding to the Women's Prize along list this year. And we both just were kind of like, there's... There's nothing to say. But one list that we are both really excited about is the International Booker Prize long list that was just announced on March 10th, right? Um, and I think it's safe to say, Matthew, that this is a very Matthew list. So I'm going to let you talk about your impressions first. Absolutely. Yeah, I do think it is a very Matthew list. I mean, in part because there is an influx of East Asian literature, which is like, never happens for the Booker Prize. Um, we have a Japanese novel, we have two Korean novels, and then we even have uh, a novel in Hindi, which is like, for the first time, I think, for the Booker this year. So just like expanding the kind of repertoire or breaking out of the the Swedes of it all um, <laughs> and and embracing just like the fact that the, the world is quite large and if you're trying to do something international, maybe incorporate powerhouse countries that are pumping out amazing works of literature year after year. How many books have you read from the list, first of all? Um, I have read one, two, three, four so far. Mm -hmm. And I've read zero books from this list, but that's because there's only one Eastern European author. And I don't want to read the books of Jacob yet because I want to read Olga Tokarczuk's other books first. Yeah, I feel like these are like oddly sexier than the normal choices. Like they're they're... I don't want to use commercial as a pejorative in any way, in any way. Like, I think that these are very commercial books. I do feel like there's this kind of um, uh, association with the Booker Prize being stodgy in a sense. Of the four books that you read, what were your reactions to them? Would you recommend them? Um, so the ones that I have read, I've read Love in the Big City by Sung Young Park, which is translated by Anton Hur. I read Curse Bunny, which is translated by Anton Hur. I read After the Sun by Jonas Eka. I believe that's how that's pronounced. Uh, and I read the David Grossman before work. Mm -hmm. um, David Grossman was lovely. Um, and I think that like his books tend to be different from one another enough where you could kind of start anywhere. And if this is like your prompting to pick up a book from him, go for it. Um, the Jonas Eka, the After the Sun is truly bizarre, truly queer, such a, a a fever dream, trippy, fun time, questionable short story collection, maybe novel interconnected. I don't know. Like it's it's a lot of like fun to pick apart type of book. Cursed Bunny, great short stories, and I'm not somebody who likes short stories that much. Um, but I enjoyed this kind of like horror feminist collection. And then Love in the Big City was in my um, top books of the year list uh, this past year. And I just, I, I love the book. It's, it's, it's not what I imagine like a Booker Prize winning book to be. And therefore I don't necessarily think it would win, but I'm so excited how many people are going to pick it up. Like, I think it is just such a lovely piece of literature to come out of Korea. Super gay, super fun, such a lovely examination of the way that people just fleetingly leave our lives, like just the unceremonious way that people enter and exit and can mean the world to you, but then just disappear, um, which is just something that does happen in real life. And then also one of the coziest, most comforting depictions of living with HIV that I think I've ever read in a novel. Um, I feel like most HIV or AIDS novels deal so heavily with just worry, fear, trauma. And all of that is present in this book. Like that's going to be a facet of that experience as a gay man. But this book so lovingly embraced HIV as like a part of a character's life. And I had yet to see that done so well in a book before. My topic from the long list is The Book of Mother by Violaine Huisman. Um, and it's translated by Leslie Camille. And I, I, I think, is this translated from French? We can, we can discuss that in, in a minute or so. Um, but it's about this um, woman whose mother is described as beautiful and charismatic, smokes too much, drives too fast. Um, and then this amazing mother is hospitalized after her third divorce and a breakdown. And it's actually the story of this woman coming to terms with the fact that her childhood with this like mother that she idolized was traumatic um, and that her mother 
in retrospect, wasn't the mother that she imagined her to be. I don't know. It seems like if you like push on Gilmore girls just a little bit, <laughs> then like if Laura and I were to have like a drinking problem, this is what would come out of it. Another reason that this stood out to me is because some elements of it remind me of Actress by Anne Enright. The only detriment to this book to me is its cover. I think it's super uggo, but um, <laughs> you know, this almost to me reads like a reversed My Name is Lucy Barton and probably more dramatic. Um, but I do like the idea of sudden tragedy putting strain on familial relationships. Like I've never not read, I've, I've, I've never read a book with that as its plot and not loved it. The other one that's near the top is Paradise by Fernanda Melchor. And it's translated by Sophie Hughes and um, uh, Melchor is a, a Mexican writer. And you read um, Hurricane Season, right? Yes, I did. I loved Hurricane Season. Uh, I think because I read Hurricane Season, I have no desire to like immediately run to this book. Like, I think it'll just be kind of there waiting for me to enjoy at a later date. Mm -hmm. And I don't feel compelled by the prize to get to it like I had for Hurricane Season, seeing all of the praise that that book received. Mm -hmm. And conversely, because I didn't actually get to Hurricane Season, I'm like, okay, now is the time. (laughs) This is a sign that this is the time where you should be swept up in the wave. Another one that I think is right up at the top of both of our lists is Tomb of Sand by Gitanjali Shri, and it's translated by Daisy Rockwell. Um, Because this one is about the legacy of partition, and it's also a family story. And I was saying to you the other day that I'm, I'm so interested in partition stories in particular because of how it aligns with my studies of Central Europe. Um, And those are kind of two historical parallels that are very useful for me, comparison-wise. This is the first book from Hindi to be long-listed. Oh my God, you're kidding Um, me. Wow. And uh, they they make a note of that in the, if you like go to their website, it's like, and special this year, the first time. And I'm like, the first time? And then Cursed Bunny is, I think, completes kind of my top four. I just love the sound of it. And I'm not even on TikTok, but I, I have seen this cover everywhere. And I love yeah. it. It's found this like lovely niche following. And I think that that is exactly the kind of following that this book deserves is like a wildly dedicated fan base. Which are your top picks that you want to read from the long list? Ooh, that I want to read. I mean, uh, Tomb of Sand. Yes, we talked about that. Um, the Claudia Pinheiro I'm really interested in. Elena Knows. Uh, mm-hmm. It's translated by Francis Riddle. And I'm interested in this um, in part because of the way that Jen Campbell talked about it in her Charco Press video that she did. Uh, that I, that intrigued me enough. And knowing that this was like a famous crime novelist that I had not heard of, I was curious. I also think that anytime crime fiction is long listed for a literary prize, I'm, I need to know. I really like the fact that I think of the two books translated from Spanish on this list, one author is Mexican and one is um, Argentine. I think Heaven is probably in my top four. Mm-hmm. Um, the Miyako Kawakami, which is the, the Japanese nom for the year. I had a lot of issues with Breasts and Eggs. I felt like it was a very, very flawed book, but I thought it was not undeserving of the excitement and buzz around it. So I'm just curious with a different story with perhaps different subject matter, what this author will do. And also I'm curious with concision, what this author would do, because the big problem with Breasts and Eggs amongst ideology that I disagreed with was that after the book was acquired as a novel, the author wrote the second part. And the first part is just significantly stronger, concise, just taut and delicious. And then the second part is like, why did you keep going? I already do have plans to read the books of Jacob. I just don't think I'll get to it in time for either the shortlist or the winner to be announced. Like, I mean, I feel this way about um, the the third book in the Cromwell trilogy, where I was like, th- this being long-listed, for the Booker Prize isn't going to push me to read it immediately. This is a book that I know I will read in the future. And when I want to read it and when it's right for me, that's when I'm going to read it, <laughs> you know? So then of the books we haven't discussed yet, um, there's one called Happy Stories Mostly by Norman Erickson Pasaribu and just translated by Tiffany Sao. Do you know anything about that one? I'm familiar with the author, just like the conversation about them on Twitter. And I'm familiar with the translator in the same way. And I've always been intrigued, but I do believe that this is short stories, mm-hmm. so I likely will not be reading it. Because it's um, a blend of science fiction, absurdism, and alternative historical realism that aims to destabilize the heteronormative world. 
Um, and it's inspired by Simone Weil. There's one called Phenotypes by Paulo Scott, and that's translated by Daniel Hahn. And this description is not doing this book any favors from what I can tell, because I've read this description at least four times now, and I still can't remember when I look when I look at the book. The description is about two very different brothers of mixed black and white heritage. And then the only one left that we haven't talked about is called A New Name by John Fossey, and it's translated by Damien Searles. Um, and it's because it's the sixth six to seventh part of a septology is it the sixth part of a septology i don't even know what this i means. think so like because wasn't this long listed wasn't the previous book long listed last year no memory of it but that's partially because all the Fitzcarraldo covers just swarm together he's been called the beckett of the 21st century which might be interesting to you that's a pretty cool sell yeah that's like i mean i'm intrigued but like not enough to pick up a book and have it on my shelf that's called a new name Septology, Roman numeral to Roman numeral. Do you have any sense looking at any of these books, ones that you think have the potential to be shortlisted, ones that you would be surprised to see shortlisted? Just your very early impressions. Um, ooh, uh, I think Tomb of Sand has a really good shot at being shortlisted, if only for the hype of it being the first Hindi novel. I mean, I'm sure it's a great book. I'm excited to read it. But I think that is adding to the possibility. Mm. I'd be curious to see After the Sun be shortlisted as like the kind of like niche contender, like the kind of like upstart of the bunch, because it is, I hate throwing around the word experimental for a book that is so vividly described and accessible in many other ways. Um, but I think that uh, that is the book that is the book that people are going to have the most strong opinions about, I think, of all this list. I could see paradise make the shortlist for sure i could see david grossman but i feel like it might be like a legacy thing like mm -hmm. almost like obligatory and also i do feel like it is the most literary fiction of the bunch i have a feeling about five of them um tomb of sand and after the sun uh the books of jacob i think will be shortlisted paradise um and heaven are the five like knowing nothing having read none of these books just with my like literary judge sense which has been worth very little in the past and probably will be this time also those are five that i wouldn't be surprised to see shortlisted but what i'm most interested in is whether i think the books of jacob actually has a chance of winning and i say that because i would be very surprised right not to be shortlisted but so far the critical reception in english has been a little more tepid than the reception within Poland, where this is really like her her most revered book I've heard there, or, or one of her most revered books. There seems to need to be cultural context in order to appreciate this book to its fullest extent that I think that the US in particular really lacks. That kind of gets into my my next question, which is about the presentation of all this on the website, and I'll leave it linked below so that any viewers can go see what I'm talking about, where part of the reason we haven't had this beat by beat, oh, it's translated from this language and this author is from this country or currently living in X country, is that the website seems to me to be purposely vague ab about those kinds of things. And it seems like there's a copy and pasted book copy description of each and that there's a copy and pasted author bio and whatever happens to be in there from the publisher is what's in there on the website now. Um, and it's not immediately apparent for a number of these books, like what country this is from, what language this is from. And I'm curious if you also read that this is intentional from the website and what your thoughts are on that. I do think it's intentional because I do think in previous years they put the country. I think that in part, it seems like they're trying to give each of these books a universal chance to be appealing because there are readers out there who would be like, I don't want to read anything from Japan. Like I read Japanese books all the time and I know what that means. You know, like there's that, that thing like, Oh, I know what a book from X country is like. And I feel like they're trying to avoid that by maybe not listing it. At least that's my optimistic hope in terms of like us just finding out information. It's really annoying. And <laughs> I don't want to have to like dig in to find out what, languages these books come from but in terms of like offering these books to the everyday reader i think that it's kind of nice so that there aren't any preconceived notions as to what the book might be like 
Yeah, I would agree with that interpretation. I do think that there's a push for universality here um, and for the the strength of the book's description to rest on its own and not be pegged a certain way. Um, but of course, then I, I do think it's helpful. And, and I, I guess if you have the book in your hands, it'll be more forthcoming <laughs> and you're like, you'll know what language it's from. And so I, I guess this won't be an issue, but like it, it is useful to know that a book is coming from Korea or it's useful to know that a book is coming from Brazil. And, and, you know, cause especially if like the Brazilian book is talking about racial dynamics and it's like, okay, this is very important to know that this is Brazil. My final thing I wanted to mention, and I'm curious what you think is that I am such a hypocrite um, when it comes to, I mean, pretty much every aspect of prizes, but in this specific case, I love that the international booker has a mixture of novels and short story collections and books that like veer strongly into nonfiction um, in certain years. Um, but I also don't want that for a lot of literary prizes. Like I wouldn't like it if that were the case for the women's prize or the English language booker prize or because it, there is like a, a comparing apples and oranges quality to it. And I think it's a lot like easier and a lot more streamlined for judges to decide if everything is a novel or if everything is a short story collection like that, that year that a uh, graphic novel was long listed for the booker and everybody was like, Oh, we're going to find the snobs. Now it's the people who don't want this on the list. <laughs> there were plenty of people who were like, I don't know, man, I think it's really hard to judge the quality of a graphic novel <laughs> alongside a, the quality of books that have no graphic component. Um, but I, I, that's one of the things that excites me most about the international booker. First of all, I am a hypocrite in every aspect of my reading and everything that comes out of my mouth ever. So you're totally fine. <laughs> um, but I, I agree that at least in this case, I really do enjoy that we have the opportunity for short stories to mesh with novels, to mesh with experimental what's its and doodads. Like, I think because even the concept of what a novel should be is so rigidly American and UK, like in terms of the way that the readership of this prize views what a book should be like is what it is. I think that the opportunity to blow that open and just kind of expand our minds to the concept that like what a novel might be considered in another country might be different than ours is like a very simple but effective thing to think about. I'm not going to go crazy I probably won't read uh, the whole short list regardless of what's on there. Um, but I'm excited to dip in in a casual way as a casual reader who loves this prize and is going to read a, f a few books because of it. Same. I have fully embraced the lukewarm engagement of literary prizes as part of my reading life. Yeah. And especially with the women's prize, but with prizes in general, I feel like several years ago I was almost in a love affair with them where it was, it felt tempestuous emotionally to me. And I was really involved and I was questioning little things. And I was like, why did you do that? Why did you say that? Um, and now it's like, we broke up, but amicably. And I still like go out for coffee with my ex lover, you know, but it's like chill and enjoyable in a way that it wasn't when we were together. <laughs> you know, not to say that we are incredible, amazing, wonderful readers, but that, in our youth, in our uh, booktubing <laughs> youth, or, we were still developing taste at a rapid rate, right? Mm -hmm. Like this was kind of a, a, a jump start to our reading was literary prizes and engaging with them on booktube. And at least for me, I can say that I had such a concern with aligning my tastes with judges and with literary critics and making sure that I was reading correctly and reading better and reading right. And in many ways, I do think that judges and literary critics do point a needle for us. But like, if I want to go a little Northwest, I'm gonna, like, I think it's fine. Mm -hmm. And I don't necessarily feel like I need to develop my taste in the way that I kind of needed to mm -hmm. as a younger reader. Mm, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. I don't know if I had exactly the same outlook on it at the time, but I was stumbling in the dark in the same way about my own taste and book prices were so helpful with that in terms of revealing the gap between the reader I thought I was and the reader I was actually developing to be. <laughs> and um, now we're, we're just much better equipped to use these lists for our 
purposes. I want you to pick a favorite to win and then what you think will actually win. You know, I think three of the books that have the most chance to win are the ones that would excite me the most. I think the books of Jacob has a good chance to win. I would love for Tomb of Sand to win, but again, that's without having read it. And even if it's like the first book to be listed from Hindi, if I don't think it's a good book, then I won't want it to win, <laughs> you know? Um, and then the Fernanda Melchor too. Um, I think like her being long listed again and hurricane season having been received so long, it feels like we're building to something with her prize wise. I agree. I feel like she's a very sexy author right now. I feel like what she's writing about, I think the aesthetic is like really cool and trendy right now, especially. And I think Sophie Hughes is is doing great work. So Mm -hmm. that is my pick of who I think will win the booker. So for any of you watching currently, would you like us to do a shortlist reaction? How involved would you want us to be in the international booker this year in your feeds? We also might do a women's prize shortlist reaction. We may not. We're going to just let the wind blow where it blows on that one. But yeah, let us know down below what your preferences would be. Thanks for watching. And um, I'll see you soon for another video. And go check out Matthew's recent video about the books he bought while he was in the hospital. (laughs) It's been a rough year. But we're glad that the the international booker came through for you. and made it a little less rough than it otherwise needed to be. That is a very lovely way to end this video. (laughs) 